Over the 45 years from 1820 to 1865, American literature went through a reshaping that changed the way Americans look at literature and the way they respond to the written word. Numerous political and social shifts occurred during this time, each influencing a subset of American authors who then reflected and shaped the culture in turn. Out of this, movements such as American Romanticism and Transcendentalism, which we will discuss further in this video, were allowed to grow and develop, and therefore the young nation that was the United States continued to individualize itself from the rest of the world. Each movement and line of thought that developed during this time period became crucial in the effects they had on the writers and ergo the nation's populace. For example, two movements that were tied together was the abolitionist cause as well as the push for women's rights. These were even so powerful as to produce literary genres of their own, such as the slave narrative, which will be discussed later in greater detail. Going hand in hand with this was the overtones of feminine liberation projected by the influential female authors of the time, such as Grimke or Harriet Beecher Stowe, which can be seen in their writings. These social and political tensions eventually led to the bloodiest battle in American history, the Civil War. While we today know this as a struggle mainly over the abolition of slavery, this was a decisive matter, but in addition to this, a large part of the disagreement was over the power of the legislation of individual states versus the power of the federal government. We can see the effect that literature had on this conflict, for instance, the proliferation of slave narratives. Narratives such as the interesting life of Alauda Equiano helped Americans who had never been exposed to the atrocities of slavery to have the ugly truth thrust in their faces and therefore there was a large outcry for change. However, at the same time, there was also much less outcry against the egregious actions taken against the American Indians. The largest act of cruelty toward these people being the Trail of Tears, which took the entire Cherokee Nation and forcibly removed them from their home. Even so, there was much less outcry over this. However, the atrocity was not overlooked by such people as Ralph Waldo Emerson, a member of the Transcendentalist Movement. Throughout the course of American history, religion has been critical and driving factor in major events. During this time period, we see several different schools of thought crop up in the aftermath of the Great Awakening, a religious movement which had been led by strong Protestant preachers such as Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield. However, now there was a shift to a less Christian national mindset. Out of this came the movements of Romanticism, Transcendentalism, and even Gothic literature. And while these are not blatantly anti-Christian, they are not advocating for Christian religiosity. Transcendentalism, for example, was more of a spiritual journey that involves the continual questioning of truth and morality. In this video, we'll dive into the lives and works of six different authors, two representing each category of Romanticism, Transcendentalism, and a genre known as slave literature. Our first genre is that of American Romanticism. Romanticism, despite the common misconception, is not comprised of dollar a dozen romance novels. Quite the opposite. American Romanticism was a movement mainly focused on poetry. The movement took from many different aspects of literature, particularly those of European descent. According to Naresian, quoted in Virginia Jackson's work, American Romanticism Again, it is safe to assume that the term, being Romanticism, refers to the history of ideas that stretched from the mid-18th and 19th century European national revolutions, especially the French, and that found a literary home in British poetics. American Romanticism, and Romanticism as a whole, was a transatlantic movement that flowed from Europe into the New World, and as with many things, Americans changed it into something new, adding their own spin on the ideas. It is difficult to nail down particular authors, such as Edgar Allan Poe, as being definitively romantic or not, as often there is some gray area between Romanticism, Transcendentalism, and even into Gothic, which Poe is normally attributed. For many authors, their genre of writing could vary greatly from one work to the next. Often they tended to melt into each other's styles throughout individual works as well. Overall, American Romanticism is a culmination of abstract philosophy that placed great emphasis on three main ideas, inspiration, subjectivity, and the importance of the individual. One of the greatest Romantic poets was Walt Whitman. Whitman wrote many pieces over his career as an author, including Leaves of Grass and O oh Captain, My Captain. And as Jackson said, no poet would fit the American romantic lyric general bill better than Walt Whitman. Whitman was born in New York in 1819 and at 12 began to work as a printer, which is where he learned to love writing. 
Later in his life, he would even go on to found his own newspaper, The Long Islander. During his later life and the time of the Civil War, Whitman even visited the soldiers, including his own brother, who had been wounded. In 1873, Whitman was struck by a stroke, and he eventually passed away in March of 1892. Whitman's poetry is very inspiring and empowering often to the individual. Throughout his work, he seems to rest on the idea that man has intrinsic value, perhaps not quite in the sense that the Protestants of the previous century would have believed, but in a similar way, often Whitman recognizes the strength and capability of a person, despite what shortcomings they may have. Whitman even has a poem aptly named Song of Myself, in which he begins with the lines, I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume. In addition to this, many of his works tend to focus on the natural world. Later on in the same poem, Whitman begins to talk of the mountains, cattle, streams, and various natural things. He says, the sharp-hoofed moose of the north, the cat on the house sill, the chickadee, the prairie dog, and continues his description of nature. One of the prominent characteristics of Whitman's work is his lack of rhyme scheme and consistent meter. While the way he speaks is very poetic in nature, he does not adhere to the status quo that many other poets held during the time. One of his poems that was published even received great backlash over the lack of consistency. According to Jackson, the reviewer said that the poem, in nose-pinching scare quotes, devolves into meaningless twaddle. This was not to say that Whitman was truly a poor poet, but instead, he was simply too radical from the other mainstream authors of his time. Another fantastic romantic poet was Emily Dickinson. Dickinson was a very reserved, private individual, born in Massachusetts in 1830. She began writing in her teenage years, being inspired by other authors of the time, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson. It is said by some that Dickinson was agoraphobic, and that she quite possibly had depression or anxiety. She died in 1886, when she was only 55 years old, in her home of Massachusetts. Unfortunately, Dickinson's work was not widely recognized by the public until after her death. While she did have several pieces published during her lifetime, she wrote much more than anyone knew. Her sister, who discovered her vast collection of writings, published the majority of them posthumously. Many of her poems did not have titles and therefore are referred to by either a prominent line in the work or are simply numbered for classification. Dickinson's writing mostly focused on religion, nature, and complex, nuanced issues such as death, suffering, and interpersonal relations. Unlike Whitman, often her poetry had a definitive rhyme and meter scheme that helped to guide her reader along the path of the text. For instance, her poem, number 479, begins with these lines, Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves, and immortality. As a devout Christian, she did focus a great deal on her faith and delved into many spiritual concepts. Another aspect of her work that is not often clear at first glance was the precise meaning of what her work is. Dickinson uses a great deal of obfuscating language that forces her audience to take a closer look at her real intentions. We see this especially in her poem, Tell All the Truth, But Tell It Slant. To this day, it is under discussion whether it is referencing her faith, her opinion of telling lies, or even how to persuade someone of something. Whatever she intended, it is indisputable that the words are meant to draw the reader in and force them to study her language, and that is precisely what it has done for 130 years. In a similar vein to Romanticism lies the Transcendentalist movement. While Romanticism focused mainly on escapism and the perfection that could be achieved in literature, Transcendentalism was a movement that whose adherents thought objective truth and ultimate reality was unknowable, but should be pursued. The movement began in New England, and they also focused greatly on nature similar to the Romantics and believed that each person had some sort of intimate knowledge of God. However, even as they believed in a sort of special knowledge, the Transcendentalists did not try to distance themselves from the world or from literature and society. Instead, they sought to work and influence from inside of it. Isabel Alfandri writes, Unlike the Western metaphysical tradition founded by Plato, the tradition of thought of which Emerson is the founder does not make separation from the letters its founding act. On the contrary, transcendentalism simultaneously calls for American literature and American philosophy in a common summoning in space-time. As mentioned by Alfandri, one of the best-known transcendentalists was Ralph Waldo Emerson. As mentioned earlier, Emerson was the one to write a letter to the then-current U.S. President Martin Van Buren. 
Emerson is well known for many works, including his pieces Self-Reliance and Nature. Emerson was born in 1803 in Massachusetts. In his early years, he took after his father to become a minister, but after his wife died in 1831, he left the faith and the clergy. After this, he took a trip to Europe, where he interacted with many of the great European writers, including Thomas Carlyle and William Wordsworth. Once he returned home, he married his second wife and began to write in the 1830s. In 1832, he joined the movement of transcendentalists and eventually became one of the pillars of transcendentalist thought. Some of his contemporaries included Emily Dickinson and even Henry David Thoreau, another transcendentalist. Emerson's writing is very poetic. He uses the tools of literature to craft a well-thought-out arc of thought, but in turn also creates a smooth flow from idea to idea. While Emerson did have a crisis of faith, his work seemed to retain the spirituality that he was familiar with, and using this, he often made comment on the status of society. For example, looking at his work Self-Reliance, Emerson crafts a metaphor. Society is a joint stock company, in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue in most requests is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities or creators, but names and customs. In this passage, it is obvious that Emerson makes a criticism of the current society through his symbolic language. A joint stock company is essentially the original model for investing in a corporation, and Emerson shows here how this can be extremely socially detrimental to a society. Because a large, overpowering company, for example the East India Company, which ran out of Britain, had such a large reach and influence over the welfare and lives of a populace, it is only logical that whatever is in the company's interest should be in its constituents' interest. And therefore, it deteriorates individual culture and, as Emerson says, self-reliance. We can compare this to the large multinational conglomerates of the 21st century, for example Google. Since Google is such a large and influential company, there is almost no other entity that can keep them in check. As they spread throughout the world, Google, being an American company, continues to spread Western ideas around the globe, and the westernization of the planet continues, and in some cases, this can even lead to the destruction of entire cultures as they rely on the corporation for so much, they begin to adopt the dress, style, music, and even ideals of a foreign nation. Another strong proponent of transcendentalism was Washington Irving. Irving was also a very romantic writer, and his literature suggests strong influences of romantic thought. However, he was also greatly affected by the transcendental movement. Irving was born in 1783 in New York. He grew up in a Christian household and began to publish some of his writing under the pseudonym Jonathan Old Style Gent, which were published in his brother Peter's newspaper, The Morning Chronicle. During his lifetime, Irving traveled all around the world to places such as Germany, Spain, Austria, and Canada, until he finally settled for the rest of his life, living on the Hudson River, and he was devoted to his writing. He had become quite a well-known author, and the first true international literary success that came from the United States. Perhaps Irving's most well-known work is Rip Van Winkle. This story shows a man for which the piece is named, who mystically finds himself asleep in the mountains for 20 years. When he awakes, he returns to have found his wife dead, his children grown, and the praise for King George of England replaced with praise for Washington, the first president of the newly emancipated nation. In this work, similarly to Emerson, Irving takes note of the social and political ongoings of the United States and its people in great depth. He covers a vast expanse here, from the marital issues of a nagging wife on Mr. Winkle to the revolution that he had missed during his snooze. Irving writes, What courage can withstand the ever-during and all-besetting terrors of a woman's tongue, in reference to Rip's wife? And even later in his writing, Rip is ostracized for saying, I am a loyal subject to the king. God bless him. Despite this slip-up, Rip's community afterward accepts that he was simply ignorant, and they embrace him back into the community warmly and fondly. Walter Scheer writes in his journal, Because of the way the affectionate recognition builds to a communal dimension, Rip seems to take his place as one of the first American celebrities. And what the community chooses to have Rip represent has a happy coincidence with the passive existence he resumes. Irving here shows that despite what he may have said about the king and all of the things he missed in his sleep, the American people are more than happy to re-accept Rip into their society as long as he is genial and stays quiet and compliant. 
This criticism of American thought seems harsh, that they will only accept you as long as you do not disrupt the status quo, but it seems that Irving was right here, and there's a great support for that statement. Again, we see his work's transcendental qualities showing through here, as a way to influence the culture from inside of it, while only subtly rocking the boat. Our last genre of literature for this time period is slave literature. This sort of writing can be extremely difficult to read, as there is violence, abuse, and it shows some of the horrific things that were enacted against people with a darker complexion inside of the United States. Slave literature can be described as any sort of literature, often narrative, that sheds light on the detrimental actions taken against African slaves in an effort to educate or even sometimes shock the reader into action. The power of slave literature and slave narratives was one that had an immense impact across the globe, particularly in nations such as the United States or Britain, where the vast majority of the workforce was made up of African slaves. While this was greatly accepted for a long time, until the proliferation of slave narratives, people did not realize the hell that this put the slaves through, and in some instances, they did not even consider them to be human, or on a human level, until they were educated by these writings. The first writer of the genre we will look at is Frederick Douglass. Douglass was born a slave in 1818 in Maryland. He wrote several pieces specifically about his time in slavery and the experiences therein. He was raised by his grandmother, as his mother had passed away when he was only 10 years old. Douglas was able to learn the alphabet and to learn how to read from some white children, and also from reading the New Testament. Eventually, once he escaped from slavery, he continued to write and speak to attempt to educate Americans, both white and black, and to help them see how detrimental slavery was to their society. He published his autobiography in 1845, and even had to travel overseas to avoid being sent back to slavery. His cause for racial justice was also tied into the women's rights movement of the time, and he was the only African American to attend the Seneca Falls Convention. Later in his life, after the outbreak of the Civil War, Douglas became even more famous across the states, and even worked directly with President Lincoln in the fight against slavery and racism until his eventual death in 1895. Douglas wrote several works, including his autobiography, and several narratives of his life as a slave. Perhaps one of the most emotional and powerful pieces is What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? In this work, he discusses at length the hypocrisy of America's state. While written directly into the legal documents of the United States, the rhetoric of inalienable rights and certain liberties endowed by a creator were thrown out the window for slaves. In this passage, Douglas uses powerful language to invoke emotion in his readers. He says, Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions, whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilant sounds that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Douglas here sees this blatant contradiction. For a nation that is supposedly in favor of equality for all, it is plainly egregious that it can celebrate all of its achievements when such an evil as slavery is still accepted. He continues on, near the end of the passage, saying, With all your religious parade and solemnity, are here to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There are several factors that led to this to be a powerful speech, beginning with his real experience. Douglas, as a freed slave himself, realizes the power that his first-hand experience has, and so the emotion he puts into his words are all the more powerful. In addition to this, he shows that he has much more in common with the whites than they would naturally think by using the rhetoric of Christians. As a Christian himself, he was able to speak their language, and in turn, it made them trust him even more. Alan DeSantis sums up the power of Douglas's speech by saying, The gifted orator not only acrimoniously scolded his white audience, he also highlighted the hypocrisy of celebrating independence while four million blacks remained enslaved, used separatist language in bifurcating black and white interests, and instilled nationalistic shame. The second and final author of the slave literature genre is a woman by the name of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Many know Stowe for her novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, a narrative of the life of several slaves. In contrast to many of the other abolitionist writers of her time, Stowe was white. She was born in 1811 in Connecticut as one of 13 children. 
She was given a strong education, the kind that usually only young men would receive during that time. She married Calvin Stowe, a fellow abolitionist, and published her first version of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1851. Similarly to Frederick Douglass, during the Civil War she met personally with Abraham Lincoln. She continued to write on social and political issues until her death in 1896. In Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe attacks the practice of slavery through prose. Her story follows a group of slaves who are sold from a more affectionate family into a rough situation. Stowe uses many different literary devices in this novel, relying heavily on the phonetic spelling of words to make them seem as though they were spoken, such as master instead of master, or yourself instead of yourself. And this helps to create the accent and speech pattern of these specific characters. Through the power of her imagery and writing, Stowe helps to create in the mind of the reader a vision of these people who are suffering a great deal at the hands of slavery and lead to the outcry against such atrocities. Julie Wilhelm even contrasts this outcry to the emotion of a powerful religious gathering. She says, In particular, embodied black group dynamics in Uncle Tom's Cabin recall contemporary criticism about social emotionality that was thought to run rampant in religious revivals. Again, similarly to Douglas's writings, Uncle Tom's Cabin was powerful not only because it induced a religious-like uprising, but also was able to make the slaves and the African-American population more relatable to white America, and therefore helped to produce sympathy for their fellow human beings. Stowe was able to show that the blacks were so similar to whites, they shared a religion, being Christianity, and even shared common goals, such as the evangelism of non-Christians, and simply the desire to protect one's own family. Similarly to every time period in human history, the early 1800s were a time of social and political uprising, leading to the biggest conflict in American history. There was a great deal of fighting done in the realm of social justice and the goal of achieving true equality for all Americans, and literature was the conduit that allowed the general population to see the errors in the current way of thinking. Without the literature from such great writers as the six we explored in this video, the United States would not be nearly the nation it is today, and may have continued down a dark path for many years to come.